What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to an audiobook that I am super duper excited to read. This is B7. Now, from an outside perspective, uh, you probably are thinking, what the hell is the title B7? I was thinking the same thing, but this story is insane. It is, it, I would go as far as to say it's more extreme than under construction. I think that's debatable. This is one of my favorite stories, okay? I'm just putting it out there. This is so good, and I haven't even read the actual thing yet. So hopefully there's going to be even added emotion and pain and torture. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I am super duper excited to read through this. I have been waiting for so long. Let's get into B7. Sitting on the blue braided rug, cross-legged with his back against the big grey sofa in his family's living room, Billy snatched an oatmeal cookie from the plate his mum had set on the low coffee table in front of him. He took a bite and looked eagerly across the room to the TV. It's almost time, he shouted, spewing cookie crumbs over his skinny bare legs. Don't talk with your mouth full, Billy's father said. Billy grinned up at his dad. Sorry, he said, spraying more crumbs. He giggled when he realised what he'd done. His dad shook his head and ruffled Billy's hair. Then Billy's dad took a seat on the sofa next to Billy's mum. He picked up the newspaper and opened it wide. The paper crackled and Billy's dad cleared his throat like he always did when he started to read the paper. Outside, the neighbour's dog barked. That meant it was getting dark. The dog always barked when it started to get dark. Billy liked these always things. He was only five years old, but he'd already learned that the place could be a scary place, that the world could be a scary place. When he was three, he got really sick and he had to have loads of awful needles stuck in his back and he had to be away from his parents. It was terrifying and he never knew when something like that would happen again. Always things felt like they had bad surprises away. They, they kept bad surprises away, I'm sorry. When always things happened, Billy could tell himself everything was okay. Billy's mum reached out and turned on the big blue lamp sitting on the end table next to her. The lamp filled the room with yellowish light. She nudged Billy's dad. You know, if you set a better example, Billy's mum said, he wouldn't do that. Hmm, Billy's dad said. He always said hmm if you talked to him while reading the paper. Billy wasn't sure what his mum meant by a better example, but he didn't care much. All he cared about right now was that Freddy and Friends was about to start. Like father, like son, Billy's mum went on. Out of the corner of his eye, Billy saw his mum elbow his dad. You always talk with your mouth full at dinner when you get revved up about work, Billy's mum said. You two are like peas in a pod. Billy did not know what that meant. His mum had said that a lot of times, most recently on Billy's fifth birthday. You look and act more and more like your father every year, his mum had said to Billy the morning of his birthday. She'd been helping him get dressed, and she'd been looking over his head into the full-length mirror on the back of his bedroom door. You're like two peas in a pod. Gazing at his reflection, Billy had seen what his mum meant, sort of, with brown hair that never wanted to lay down quite right, small brown eyes, a round nose and cheeks, and a wide mouth. Billy did look like a shrunk-down version of his dad. He didn't look at all like his pretty blonde mum. He just looked like his dad. He didn't really think he acted like his dad, though. His dad wasn't home that much. He went to an office and worked all the time. And when he was home, he was usually either reading the paper, watching sports on TV, or sleeping. Billy did a lot more stuff than his dad did. He thought the only thing they had in common was TV, and they watched different stuff. For instance, his dad never wanted to watch Freddy and Friends. Billy gazed at the TV, and when the Fazbear Entertainment logo filled the screen, he bounced up and down on his butt. It's starting, he squealed. We were switching to the game in 15 minutes, Billy's dad said. Billy's mum picked up a magazine and started flipping through it. Oh, good grief, Dan, she said. Let him watch his show. You can miss 15 minutes of your precious game. Billy's dad said something in response but Billy didn't hear Dad's words. Billy was too busy watching Freddy, Chica and Bonnie eat pizza and talk about the camera on the wall above them. Who do you think is watching us? A cartoon Bonnie on the TV said. I don't know, Bonnie, cartoon Freddy said. 
Let's go if we can find whoever it is, Cartoon Chica said. On the TV screen, Bonnie jumped up and grabbed his guitar. Not until we play another song, he said. Okay, Freddy said. He pulled out a mic and started singing. Billy watched, fascinated. Billy liked all of the animatronics, but Freddy was his favourite. Freddy was brown like Billy's hair, and Freddy was the one on charge. Billy liked the idea of being in charge. He liked the idea of being an animatronic too. Animatronics were robots. They were strong, and he knew they didn't feel bad things like real people did. It would be nice to not feel bad things. A commercial for Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria came on the screen. It showed one of the real animatronics in the middle of a performance. Billy grabbed the TV remote and jumped to his feet. Pretending the remote was a microphone, he started dancing and singing at the top of his lungs. Billy's mum laughed. She put down her magazine and clapped her hands. Billy's dad lowered his paper and watched Billy perform. I'm an animatronic! Billy shouted. Billy's mum and dad smiled and nodded. Okay, Billy, they said in unison. You're an animatronic. Billy began marching, stiff-legged, around the living room. He stomped hard as he walked, rattling the lamps on the end tables and all his mom's knickknacks. I love this story already just because of how innocent and amazing Billy is as a character. It's so cute, oh my gosh. Billy plodded over to the entryway, right off the living room. He yanked coats off the coat rack and grabbed the rack, pretending it was a microphone stand. Pulling the stand over, he bent at the waist and sang into it. On the TV, the show returned to the screen. Billy dropped the coat rack and trudged back over to the coffee table, pretending to be like Freddy the whole time. He sat back down on the floor again, but he did it as if his arms and legs were made of metal like the animatronics' arms and legs. He put his legs straight out in front of him instead of crossing them. He liked how it felt to move like that. It made him feel big and powerful. It made him feel like nothing could hurt him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The next morning, Billy stomped down the stairs to the kitchen. He was still being an animatronic. He liked being an animatronic. Keeping his back very straight, Billy sat at the round table in his mum's yellow and white kitchen. Morning sun peeked past girly flowered curtains covering the big windows of the table. Billy, look, uh, Billy looked outside. In a loud voice as robotic as he could make it, he said, It is a pretty day. I want to go to the park after school. Billy's dad walked into the room. Why are you shouting? He asked Billy. I am not shouting, Billy said loudly. I am a robot, and this is how I talk. Oh, Billy's dad said. Okay. Billy saw his dad raise his eyebrow at his mum. He, she made a fluttery gesture with her hand. Billy's dad sighed. Taking the chair next to Billy's, Billy's dad accepted the cup of coffee in Billy's mum. A uh, Billy's mum handed to him. Billy's dad took a sip then sat up really straight and said, Oh no, wait, yeah, Oh no, I think my coffee has fried my circuits. He made a bunch of sputtering noises that sounded like a radio between stations. <laughs> he went stiff and then let his head fall forward to the table with a thunk. Billy laughed, a robotic, Ha, ha, ha. He poked his dad's shoulder. You need to go to parts and service so you can be repaired. Billy said in his new robot voice, I will save your chair while you are gone. Billy's dad raised his head. That is a good idea, he said in a deep, booming voice. I will go to parts and service. Billy's dad got up and stepped over to Billy's mum. I'll take my coffee to go and pick up something at work, he whispered to her. She nodded and poured his coffee into a travel mug. How long do you think he's going to be an animatronic? Billy's dad asked, still whispering. Billy's mom smiled over at Billy. He gave her a big smile back, exposing his teeth the way animatronics did. He'll get bored with it soon enough, Billy's mom whispered. Billy wondered why they were whispering. He could hear everything they said. Animatronics had very good auditory senses, and they didn't get bored easily. When Billy's mom took him to his kindergarten class after breakfast, Billy marched into the bright, colourful room filled with playing kids, and he announced, I am an animatronic. He pretended he was made of metal as he walked over to his friends. Two of Billy's friends immediately started acting like robots too. Clark, small and red-headed, made a good robot. He walked with his arms straight out in front of him, and he spoke with a mechanical voice. Peter wasn't as good as being, an, uh, as being a robot, because he moved too fast and bent too much. 
but he, too, did a pretty good robotic voice. Robots will take over the world, he announced. Robots rule, Billy agreed. Billy's friend Sadie didn't like that Billy was a robot. She tossed her black pigtails, put her hands on her hips and said, You're not a robot, Billy. You're being dumb. Billy stomped over to Sadie and pushed her. I am a robot and you can not call me dumb. Sadie ran to their teacher, Mrs. Foswick. Mrs. Foswick, who was very tall and had short hair and could have been a good animatronic herself, put Billy in a timeout. It wasn't a real timeout, though, because she didn't turn him off, and as long as an animatronic wasn't turned off, it kept going. So, Billy sat in the corner of the kindergarten classroom and he sang. No matter what Mrs. Foswick said to him, he didn't stop singing. Mrs. Foswick got very upset. Billy didn't tell her that all she had to do was switch him off because he didn't want to be switched off. Billy didn't tell his mum that he could be switched off either, when she came to pick him up early. All he did was stand tall and straight, while his mum talked to Mrs Foswick, and then he left the school with his mum, marching to the family station wagon and getting in the back seat. There, he sat bowled upright, his head swivelling left and right as his visual sensors gathered data about his surroundings and stored it in his processor, which then told him that the sun had gone behind clouds, and it was raining. Billy was glad he was inside the car. Rain wasn't good for animatronics. When Billy's mum got behind the wheel of the car, she turned to look at Billy. You made Mrs Foswick unhappy, she said. Mrs Foswick does not like singing robots, Billy told her. Billy's mum smiled at Billy. That might be true, but I like singing robots. What do you want to sing on the way home? Billy thought about it. I think we should sing around. He began singing. Row, row, row your boat. As soon as he reached, gently down the stream, his mum joined in. Billy thought it was good that his mum liked singing robots. After Billy and his mum went through the song twice, his mum asked, what do singing robots like to eat for lunch? Pizza, Billy boomed. Pizza it is, Billy's mum said. He glanced at Billy in her rearview mirror as she turned the car in the direction of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Now, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. This is not the Mega Pizzaplex. This is not a Pizzaplex. This is Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Okay? Take a, take a mental note of that. We are not in the in the Pizzaplex era. era. We are in the Pizzeria era. Um, just one quick thing I do want to say is Billy was watching Freddy and Friends, right? Freddy and Friends on tour, which was like the setup to Security Breach, is actually a an archived TV show. So it was from the past. It wasn't like it's not like a modern day thing. It was from the past of Freddy's. So that's something good to note. This all takes place probably a lot, uh, a lot more in the past from Security Breach rather than the future or present. Billy Circuits returned to processing his surroundings. They took note of the passing cars, the birds hopping around under bushes near the roads, and the rows of houses along the sidewalk. They filed everything in Billy's memory banks, so that when Billy's dad came home from work that night, Billy was able to recite that afternoon's events perfectly. At first, Billy's dad seemed surprised by the list of things Billy's processors recorded that day, but then he smiled and said, Well, let's see what my processors recorded today. He then listed all the things he had seen since he left the house that morning. It turned out he didn't he hadn't seen much. Billy's dad spent the day in his small office. It didn't take him long to list his desk, his shelves, his computer and his window looking out at a parking lot and the pictures of Billy and Billy's mum that hang on the wall that hung on the wall. When Billy's mum put salad and chicken on the table in front of Billy and his dad, Billy said, Robots do not eat salad. Some do, Billy's dad said. It depends on their settings. Billy's dad reached out and turned a switch under Billy's ear. There, now you're a robot that eats salads. <laughs> Billy checked with his internal systems to see if this was true. Apparently it was, but his systems didn't say Billy had to like the salad. So he ate it and he didn't like it. The next day, Mrs. Foswick was much nicer to Billy. When he stomped into the classroom, Mrs. Foswick rushed up to Billy and said, Hi, Billy, come with me. Mrs. Foswick took Billy's hand. He let her close her fingers over his stiff ones. Bending his arm only slightly, 
He walked with her, lifting his feet and bringing them down hard on the room's purple and blue rubber flooring. I made a special place for you, Mrs Foswick said. It's a place just for animatronics. Mrs Foswick led Billy to the back of the classroom and she sat him at the desk. A big cardboard sign on the desk had a drawing of a robot connected by a cord to a chair. Under the drawing, big black letters stretched across the sign. Do you know what letter that is? Mrs Foswick asked Billy, pointing at the first one. Billy recognised it. That is an A, Billy said. That's right, Mrs Foswick said. What a smart robot you are. Mrs Foswick motioned to her teacher's assistant, Mrs Harper. She was the opposite of Mrs Foswick. Miss Harper was short and had long hair that she wore in a ponytail. She was very nice. Miss Harper came over and smiled at Billy. She pulled up a chair and sat next to him. Miss Harper is going to, um, program your circuits with more letters so you can read the sign by the end of the day, Mrs Foswick said. Does that sound good, Billy? Billy nodded stiffly several times. It was good for animatronics to learn new things. Billy started singing about learning new things. He sang everything that Miss Harper taught him. While Miss Harper taught Billy, the other kids learned and played like normal. Billy's friends, Clark and Peter, had stopped being animatronics. Instead, they'd started laughing at Billy. So had the other kids. They said it was stupid that he was still acting like a robot. Billy didn't care about what the other kids said, because animatronics didn't care about things like that. He ignored the other kids, and he put his attention only on Miss Harper and what she was uploading to his databanks. By the end of the day, Billy knew what the word animatronics looked like in letters, and he knew the sign on the desk said animatronic charging station. This will be your place in this classroom for as long as you're an animatronic, Miss Harper told Billy. I'll always be an animatronic, Billy sang. <laughs> I don't know how else to sing, to sing that. <laughs> um... That, that night, Billy lay on his back in bed. He refused his mum's offer to curl up with Max. First, animatronics didn't curl up. Second, they didn't have stuffed teddy bears named Max. Billy lay straight and stiff, his arms at his sides. Animatronics didn't sleep either, but they could act like humans. Billy closed his eyes. He knew that, soon, he would be turned off so his circuits could reboot. His mum bent over and kissed his forehead. She sighed. Good night, Billy she said. Good night, Mum, Billy said. Billy listened to his mum's footsteps shuffle across the thick red carpet. Even though, even through his closed eyes, his visual sensors picked up on the room's light going out. Then his auditory sensors zeroed in on his mum's voice. She was standing in his bedroom doorway. I'm not sure what else we can do at this point, she whispered. I talked to Miss Foswick, and she agreed to play along. She assigned Miss Harper to work with Billy separately from the other kids. This is going on for too long, Billy's dad said. It's only been a couple days, Billy's mum responded. Let's give it some time. He'll get tired of it soon. Billy's processors tried to compute what he might get tired of. He was experiencing being tired in general right now. His programming was very good. He knew he should be tired when he had to go to bed. He was a very good animatronic. As he listened to his parents talking, Billy's programming began to update. The update was a download of information related to being a little boy. Billy was an animatronic, yes, but he was an animatronic designed to be his parents' son. To be his parents' son, he had to act like a small child who went to kindergarten and played games. Billy wasn't just a good animatronic, he was also a top-of-the-line animatronic. This meant he could perform any tasks set by his programming. He could act like a child and play games. He could do it well. The next morning, Billy stiffly began following his new programming. Although he was still limited by his metal limbs and he could only speak in whole words because that was what his voice box allowed, he started being his parents' son and being a little kid in kindergarten instead of being a singing robot. This new version of Billy, the animatronic, seemed to make everyone a little happier. Although Billy's friends still made fun of him, Mrs. Foswick, Miss Harper, and Billy's parents seemed pleased with the improved version of the Billy animatronic, at least for a while. As an animatronic, Billy wasn't aware of the passage of time. He didn't keep track of days and weeks and months. He did note, however, when his mum stopped talking to him, or stopped taking him to the kindergarten classroom. Have my operating specs changed again? 
Billy asked the first morning. His mum didn't put him in the car to take him to contr- to school. Billy's mum, who was making pancakes, turned and frowned at Billy. What? You did not take me to school, Billy said. Billy's mum frowned again. Then she quickly replaced the frown with a smile. Sometimes her expressions would change fast like that, and Billy would wonder if his mum was an animatronic too. School's out for the summer, Billy, his mum said. Billy ran through his circuits. He discovers his programming needed another update. What does a Billy animatronic do when it is not in school? Billy asked. Fun things, his mum answered. I will need you to input a list of those things so I can operate right, Billy told her. His mum put a plate of pancakes in front of Billy. Start with eating pancakes. That's fun. Billy lifted his fork and cut into the pancakes. He acted like it was fun. Uh, Vera pulled on her green cotton nightshirt and watched her husband, wearing a fav- his favourite baggy PJs, pull back the covers and get into their king-size bed. He switched on the brass lamp that sat on the nightstand. Dan looked at Vera. We have to do something about Billy. Vera turned back the covers on her side of the bed. She got under the sheets and leaned up against her plumped up pillows. She didn't answer back Dan at first. She just surveyed their lovely bedroom. Decorated in neutral beige and brown tones, their bedroom was a calm oasis from the stresses of daily lives. Ev- uh, she decorated the room herself and she took pride in how comfortable and soothing it was. It wasn't soothing her tonight though. I know we have to do something, Vera finally said. Oh, how she knew. It had been little over six months since her sweet little boy had stopped being her sweet little boy and instead had started acting like an animatronic. Dan picked up the TV remote, but he didn't turn on the TV. If I'd known that that show would have had this effect on him, Dan said, I'd never have allowed him to watch it. How are we supposed to know? Vera asked. It's just a silly little show. I have half a mind to sue Fazbear Entertainment, Dan said. Yeah, Dan, bro, you're not going to be able to do anything against Fazbear Entertainment, mate. (laughs) Vera turned and glared at Dan. And how would that help Billy, she asked. Doesn't matter who's responsible. What matters is taking care of him. Why can't he like sports like a normal little boy, Dan asked. Vera slapped his arm. Every child is different. I keep telling you that. Not all boys like sports, Dan sighed. He toyed with the remote. And you're still sure that going along with all this is the right idea? Dan asked. Vera shrugged. I called Dr. Lingstrom this morning after Billy asked me to input a list of fun things. I'm not sure I have much faith in Dr. Lingstrom, Dan said. She's been seeing Billy for four months and it's not helping. I don't think child psychology is a precise science, Vera said. But she assured me again that this kind of make-believe is perfectly natural for a kid Billy's age. I bet she's never heard of a kid walking and talking like a robot all the time for over six months, Dan protested. Vera chewed on her lower lip. Well, no. But she said she did treat a kid who pretended to be an alien for over a year. Why did he stop? Dr. Lingstrom wasn't sure. He just started acting normally again one day. Vera reached out for a tube of lotion. She slathered some on her hands, inhaling the lotion's soothing lavender fragrance. In the last few months, Vera had done a lot of research on how to ease anxiety. Lavender was supposed to be relaxing. She now used lavender-scented shampoo, conditioner and lotion, and she'd put lavender sachets in every drawer and closet in their bedroom. Dan had started complaining about it. Apparently his clothes smelled so much like lavender that his co-workers had started teasing him about it. I wish Billy would go back to normal, Dan said. Me too, Vera said. Billy found he was very good at meeting the fun protocol of his new programming. It mostly required him to play with toys in his yard and sit in front of the TV. It also included going to the park, eating ice cream, and playing games with his mum. It didn't, Billy noticed, involve spending time with friends. Billy didn't have friends anymore. Apparently, other kids didn't like animatronics. In addition to his fun tasks, Billy was required to visit Dr. Lingstrom. This had been something he was expected to do for several months. It had started while he was still being Billy in kindergarten. 
Dr. Lingstrom, Billy's sensors told him, was a young woman with big glasses and a bun on the top of her head. Billy always saw her in pale blue office in a pale blue office that held a desk and a play area filled with blocks and dolls. Dr. Lingstrom had Billy sit in the play area and she told him to play with the blocks and dolls. Billy, already programmed for fun, didn't have trouble with the play. He only had trouble when Dr. Lingstrom asked questions like, Why do you think you're an animatronic? And, Do you remember being just a little boy? These questions were very challenging for Billy's chips to process. They made no sense. Billy always answered the questions the same. I think I am an animatronic because I am an animatronic, Billy said. I have never... S I... No, never mind. Sorry. I have never been just a little boy. I am programmed to act like one and I do that. Dr. Lingstrom asked Billy a lot of questions that required him to access his memory banks. He answered them all. He had a lot of images and information in his memory banks. Nothing Billy said, though, seemed to make Dr. Lingstrom happy. Billy had trouble making sense of these visits with the serious woman. They were not consistent with his function of fun. The two things didn't seem to go together. Mostly, though, Billy's fun programming was effective. One day, though, the fun protocol ended. Billy's mom took him to another classroom. This was first grade, she said, and it was in a new school, a private school. None of Billy's old friends were in his school, his mom said. She said she, she said he could make new friends. Billy thought she was wrong. He didn't think the kids would like animatronics any more than his old friends did. When Billy's mum told him about the new school, Billy told her he needed a new download. What tasks would he be expected to perform? She told him to go to the classroom and learn. On the first day of first grade, Billy's new teacher, a curly-haired woman named Mrs Cromwell, asked the children to stand up and introduce themselves. Tell us your name and what you like to do, she said. Billy's auditory systems processed as three children stood and did as they'd been instructed. I'm Ellie, a little blonde girl said. I like to dance. I'm Vic, a dark-skinned boy said. I like baseball. I'm Terry, a short boy said. I play chess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mrs Cromwell pointed at Billy. Billy unfolded his metal limbs. He stood bolt upright his arms straight at the sides. I am an animatronic named Billy, he said. I like doing what I am programmed to do. The other kids in the room started laughing. Mrs. Cromwell stood. Shush, everyone hush, be nice. The laughter died down to a few giggles and snorts. Billy was not bothered by the sounds. He was an animatronic. He didn't have feelings. Nothing bothered him. According to Billy's mom, the new private school had a lot of classes that normal schools didn't have. Billy's mum told him this when she was updating his servers before he went to bed. She called this process tucking him in. It was the time uh, when she gave him the information that he required to do what he needed to do the next day. They even have a beginning robotics class for first graders, Billy's mum said. You'll learn how robots work. Billy knew how robots worked. He was a robot. He knew how he worked. The next day, however, Billy discovered that the class did teach him something. Robots, he learned, needed a special oil to lubricate their joints. Billy had never been oiled. He filed away the information in his data banks. He would do something about it when he was, he, when he was returned home from school. For a period of time, Billy wasn't sure how long a time Billy followed the protocol for a well-oiled robot. He found the necessary oil in the garage on his, dad, on his dad's workbench. The oil was clear and thick. It didn't register as pleasant to Billy's taste senses, and it gave him sensations that were not his usual state. Aches in, the, in his middle and in his head. But he didn't let that keep him from properly caring for his parts. At meals, Billy ate less and less food. In the garage... He took in more and more oil. One day, though, Billy's systems malfunctioned. When he tried to raise himself out of bed in the morning, he immediately registered that something was wrong. In his animatronic belly, pressing pain like sensory input co constricted Billy's internal parts. Aware that small beads of water had appeared on his forehead, Billy had to concentrate to get his mechanical body to make the trek from his room to the kitchen. 
Instead of feeling strong like he usually did, he felt like he was going to fall over. He almost didn't make it to his chair in the kitchen. Concentrating on putting eggs and sausage on a plate, Billy's mom didn't notice that he was malfunctioning. She didn't notice, that is, until after Billy had consumed, as he'd been programmed to, the entire plateful of eggs and sausage. It was at that point that the smell of the sausage glitched up Billy's olfactory sensors, causing the sensors to trigger a cascade of system failures. Fail, eh, failures sorry. Billy's stomach parts and his throat parts crashed together, and the eggs and sausage came back up. They erupted from his open mouth and splashed all over the floor. That day, Billy's mom took him to parts and service, although she called parts and service the hospital. Billy's memory banks brought up images of him being in the hospital when he was three, but the images did not have any negative impact on him. He was a robot, so he couldn't be upset by anything. Parts and service was just another place to be. It was neither good nor bad. Therefore, animatronic Billy was calm while he was given a complete system-wide check. The check determined that he was temporarily out of service, what his mom called sick. Billy didn't have to stay in parts and service for long, though. When he came home, he reasoned that he was fully reconfigured. He returned to his self-oiling routine. He thought it was a good routine. Maybe it wasn't, though. He was back in parts and service again the next day. In parts and service, a round-bellied, bald-headed animatronic repair person, called Dr. Reynolds, was able to detect the oil that Billy had been using. This oil, Dr. Reynolds said, was a very bad idea. But I am an animatronic, Billy objected. I must keep my joints lubricated. Dr. Reynolds had a conference with Billy's mum while Billy lay flat on his back in a bed with metal railings on the side. He lay there and looked up at the white ceiling. Dr. Reynolds and Billy's mum whispered, but Billy could hear every word. He's in Dr. Lingstrom's care, Billy's mum told Dr. Reynolds. And what does she say? Dr. Reynolds asked. She says we should play along with his fantasy. If we don't, it could cause a psychotic break. Billy ran the words psychotic break through his databases. He had no information about the word psychotic, but break had many meanings. He suspected that some of his systems were damaged in some way. This did not concern him. He trusted that Dr. Reynolds would repair them. A psychotic break will be the least of your problems if he keeps ingesting oil, Dr. Reynolds said. Well then, Billy's mum said, you need to tell him there's another way to oil his joints. Dr. Reynolds and Billy's mum stopped talking. They walked over to the bed. Sit up, Billy, Dr. Reynolds instructed. Billy sat up. You want to keep your systems in good shape, don't you? Dr. Reynolds said. Good animatronics self-regulate, Billy said. Dr. Reynolds nodded. Then I need to add some important information to your database. Are you ready for inputting? Billy nodded. He directed his unblinking gaze at Dr. Reynolds. The best oil for your particular kind of animatronic joints, Dr. Reynolds said, is olive oil. <laughs> oh... It's something that your mum can put in your food, and if you eat the food she cooks, your joints will function perfectly. Oh, okay. For a minute, I thought you were saying, just drink olive oil, mate, and you'll be okay. You'll be better. Billy looked from his mum to Dr. Reynolds and back again. He concentrated on letting the information process, in spite of the whispered conversation that he'd heard, which was something his processor couldn't quite compute. This new data was consistent with Billy's goal of being the best animatronic he could be. Because of this... Billy nodded once. I will comply. Billy remained in parts and service for another day. Then his mom brought him home. He returned to being a good animatronic. Although Billy wasn't able to keep track of time very well, he learned that certain days came just once a year. So when these days came around, he knew a year had gone by. Christmas was one of these special days. Billy had a whole set of operating protocols for Christmas. They were protocols similar to summer fun protocols, but they were more specific. At Christmas time, Billy was required to help his parents hang strings of white lights on the trees outside and help put bright hanging things on a tree that was brought inside. Billy was also required to unwrap brightly wrapped boxes that were put under the tree. This was a simple task. He opened the boxes, looked at what was inside, said, thank you, then put the <laughs> object aside before opening the next box. Animatronic Billy had four of these 
tree centered days in his memory banks before an event occurred that required him to establish some new neural networks. The event was preceded by a conversation that his auditory sensors recorded as he was passing his parents' closed bedroom door on the way to the bathroom. Although animatronics generally had no need to pee or do any of the other things done in bathrooms, Billy was nothing if not fully devoted to his child protocol. He was, he believed, a most rare animatronic in that he developed the ability to pee and brush his teeth and bathe like a normal child. The fact that all the water involved in bathing didn't short out his circuits or rust his metal endoskeleton was a testament to the effectiveness of ingesting his mum's oil olive oil. <laughs> oh, Billy, I love it. I love how this story has a lot to do with, like, innocent logic. Uh, innocent logic in a child and kind of innocent logic in a robot as well. Like, you, you don't really get that anywhere else. Anyway, Billy usually didn't allow his parents' conversations to use up his RAM. But the, ra <laughs> but the night he was heading to the bathroom, he felt compelled, for reasons he didn't understand, to stop and listen. Perhaps it was the word institution that had triggered his attention. This was a word unfamiliar to him. Billy was, however, an animatronic with exceptional artificial intelligence. He could learn, and one of the things he'd learned was that he often that he could often add to his knowledge base by placing new words or experiences in the context of their surroundings. To that end, he listened to his mum and dad talk so he could discern the meaning of institution. I'm not putting him in an institution, Billy's mum hissed right after Billy's dad spoke. He's my son. After everything he went through when he was three, when we had to leave him in intensive care. No, I'm not leaving him anywhere again. He's staying home with me. At what cost, Vera? Or Vera, sorry. I, I'm always like, yeah. Uh, you've been going along with this insane fantasy for over four years. Four years! It just can't go on. I think he'll give up soon. Something thudded against the door. Billy's auditory processors told him a shoe had just hit the wood. We don't know that, Billy's dad shouted. Shh, Billy's mum said. He'll hear you. I don't care if he hears me, Billy's dad yelled. I don't care about anything anymore. I can't take it, Vera. I can't. We have a freak for a son, and we have no life. We can't go anywhere or do anything with him. All we can do is sit at home and watch our little boy pretend to be a robot. That's not living. That's hell. Footsteps stomped across the floor behind the door. Billy strode as quickly as his rigid legs allowed into the bathroom. There, he closed the door. He heard his parents' door open. More thudding footsteps, then silence. Billy sat on the closed toilet seat and worked through what he heard. His dad, it seemed, didn't like animatronics anymore. Oh well, that was okay. Billy didn't need his dad to like him. Billy was still a very good animatronic, whether his dad liked him or not. Billy's dad left two days after the conversation Billy heard. He left, and he didn't come back. Why did dad leave? Billy asked as he watched his mum saute mushrooms and onions in olive oil. She was making spaghetti sauce. This was a red sauce that Billy thought resembled human blood. He wasn't convinced that eating it was appropriate, but he had no data with which to reach a definite conclusion. Billy's mum, who had been crying off and on throughout the day, wiped a hand across her eyes. She stopped sautéing and came over to the table to sit with Billy. She took Billy's hand. Billy, as a robot, had no need for physical touch. However, he found that the feel of his mum's hand was agreeable to his tactile senses. Therefore, he sat stiffly and let her hold his hand. Your dad doesn't understand, Billy, Billy's mum said. He thinks you can make yourself be something besides who you are. Billy cocked his head, running this through his programming. It is not possible for a thing to be not the thing it is, he said. The thing is the thing. Billy's mum made a sharp laughing sound. One laugh. It was like the bark of a big sea lion. Billy had seen sea lions on TV. They were part of his animal database, which was quite large. Billy's mum stood. She patted Billy on the top of his head. Spoken like a wise little animatronic, she said. I am not as little as I was before, Billy said. He saw himself in the mirror every day. He was much bigger than he used to be. He thought he looked even more like his dad now than he used to. But that didn't matter anymore. His dad was gone. Billy just looked like himself. Like Billy, the animatronic. That's true, Billy's mum said. 
and you'll keep getting bigger. She started to return to the stove, then turned back to the table. Billy? I am here, Billy answered. Have you ever heard of an animatronic growing before? Billy's mom's eyes were wet and intense. She, start, she stared so hard at Billy that, for a moment, she looked like an animatronic too. Billy ran the question through his processes. The answer came quickly. No, I have not heard of a growing animatronic. Does that bother you? Billy's mum asked. Her eyes shone even brighter. Billy got the idea that his mum wanted him to say something specific. He wasn't able to access information that told him what that was. No, Billy said. I am an animatronic. I do not get bothered. And why is it important that there are no other animatronics like me? There are many things that exist that I have never heard of. I am unique. Billy's mum wiped her eyes again. She sighed. Yes, you are, she said. She returned to the stove and added a can of tomatoes to the mushrooms and onions. <laughs> By the time Billy finished what was called sixth grade, he had concluded, based on the totality of his experience observing the humans around him and integrating the information that he read, that he could expand his data banks and upgrade his processes more effectively without the dubious help of teachers and school. Both of these things, he discovered, attempted to place restrictions on how Billy took in the world, and the limitations of the restrictions far outweighed any benefit he received from either teachers or school. Because Billy was an exceptional animatronic, his processes were able to integrate information from multiple sources. One of these sources was books. He was able to upload massive amounts of information from books. This was why, on the first morning of what would have been Billy's seventh grade, he announced to his mum, I will not go to school today. Billy's mum had looked unexpectedly happy about this. She'd rushed over to Billy, where he sat on the edge of his sleeping platform. The year before, he'd requested that his bed be replaced with a steel table. It was a far better recharging platform for an animatronic. Why don't you want to go to school? Billy's mum asked. Are you feeling sick? Billy cocked his head and attempted to work out why the idea of being sick made his mum's eyes light up and her mouth widen into a smile different than the ones he usually saw on her face. Billy's processes informed him that his mum's expression indicated happiness. Billy's mum leaned toward him and looked intently into his eyes. What are you feeling, Billy? she asked. I do not feel, Billy answered. I am an animatronic. Billy's mum's smile disappeared. Her eyes moistened and she rubbed them. Her shoulders slumped. I will not go to school, Billy told his mum, because the disadvantages of school outweigh the advantages. I will add to my databases by reading books. All I will require from you are the rides to the library to acquire the books necessary for my continued learning. <laughs> Billy's mum gazed at Billy for a long time. He gazed back at her. His visual senses processed what he saw. Billy had noted that as he got bigger and his face looked more like that of his now absent dad, his mum got smaller, more accurately, narrower, and her face looked less like her face. Billy had in his memory banks the image of his mum's round and smooth face, her bright blue eyes, and her shiny and bouncy blonde hair. The round face, however, was no longer round. It was more oblong, and it revealed the bone structure under his mum's skin. The skin itself didn't seem to fit the bones. It sagged, folding into little pleats between her eyes, around her mouth, and at her jawline. The skin was a different colour too. Before, the skin had been pinkish. Now it looked kind of grey. Billy's mum's eyes and hair were different too. Her eyes had lost some of their colour. They were now a faded blue. And her hair had no shine. It didn't bounce either. It hung limply, like the kind of hair Billy had seen on a rag doll. The little girl who lived next door had a rag doll. That little girl didn't like Billy. She once screamed at him that if he got close to her, she'd have her doll eat him up. <laughs> Billy was unable to process this. From what he knew of dolls, one could not consume him. Billy's mom interrupted his internal processing. She patted his thigh and stood. I'll get your breakfast, she said. After breakfast, Billy's mom took him to the library. There, he checked out a stack of eight books. This was the largest number of books he was allowed to take out at one time. I will be back in two days, Billy informed the large grey-haired librarian when she pushed the stack of books across the counter to him. The woman nodded several times, then she ran to the other end of the counter. Billy determined that something had made her nervous. 
he didn't know what that was. Billy spent the rest of the first day of no school sitting in the chair at his desk. He read all day until his processors informed him it was time for dinner. When he received that cue, Billy stood and left his room. He started down the hall, heading toward the kitchen. As Billy walked in his usual stiff-armed and stiff-legged way, he accessed a memory of how he had walked when he'd first become an animatronic. He had strode with too much force, so that every step he took stumped on the ground and rattled everything in the room he was in. It was Dr Lingstrom who had updated Billy's systems, programming him for a quieter way of getting around. You see, she told him when, he, when she'd demonstrated the new way he was to move, you can move your metal arms and legs without putting your feet down with so much force. She walked across the room using a ga gait similar to Billy's. Billy noticed how she placed her feet so that her footfalls were, silence, uh, were silent and didn't make anything shake. Billy had mimicked Dick, Dr. Lingstrom and found the result satisfactory. He had walked quietly ever since. So, now Billy approached the kitchen silently. He could mere hit, hit... Ah, sorry. He could hear his mom moving around in the small room, but she couldn't hear him. As Billy got to the doorway, before he stepped into his mom's view, he discerned what she was talking, because he knew no one was in the house beside him and his mom. Billy deduced she was talking on the phone. Billy liked the phone. He had discovered that communicating via the phone was usually more effective. That is a spelling mistake. That should be an E instead of an A. Um, it did away with the complexity of processing multiple sensory cues at once. The phone required only auditory processing. Because listening to his mom's phone's conversations often resulted in updating Billy's systems, she said things to other people that she didn't say to him, he stopped just outside the doorway to the kitchen. He focused on his mom's words. I just don't know what to do now, Billy's mom said. You told me not to force him into anything, so I didn't make him go to school. But without other kids to emulate, how will he learn to be a normal boy? Billy ran this question through his neural networks. Did it mean that he was not effectively performing his function as his mum's son? Billy listened more. Perhaps the conversation would give him more information to add to his systems. No, 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 I'm not, I, I told you I'm not pinning him someplace. You said as long as he wasn't a danger to himself or anyone else, I could keep him at home. Billy knew he was not dangerous to anyone. Although robots could be programmed to be destructive, Billy wasn't one of those. He was designed to value human life. Yes, I, I can take care of him, his mum said. He's my son. You know, I work from home so I can be here from him every day. I'll do whatever he needs. Working from home was a concept Billy understood. His mum had inputted all the necessary information about that. She was, she told him, a financial advisor and investor. She managed people's money, and she also invested her own money. She did this on her computer in the office next to her bedroom. After his mum introduced Billy to the concept of investing... He checked out books on the subject. The librarian had told him the books were too old for him. This was not something Billy could process, so he ignored it. He read the books. He wasn't able to integrate all the information into his systems, but he stored much of it, and he continued to add, that, add to that knowledge base. Every child is different, Billy's mum was saying into the phone now. Billy is Billy. I'm not going to force him to see himself differently than he does, even if what he sees isn't normal. Billy was an animatronic, so he didn't feel, but when his mum spoke, he experienced a sensation that might have been similar to an emotion. He felt an unusual warmth in the area of his heart. His processes prompted him to step into the kitchen and approach his mum. When Billy's mum saw Billy, she quickly said goodbye and hung up the phone. Billy walked over to her and rigidly encircled her stick-like shoulders with his own strong arms. Billy's mum widened her eyes at him, then she put her arms around him and she cried. One of the special days that gave Billy the ability to mark the passing of years was his birthday. A birthday, Billy understood, was the day that a human was born into the world. Because Billy was an animatronic, his birthday was more aptly called his creation day. He informed his mom of the fact that his third year of his... Uh, he had, uh, sorry. He informed his mom of this fact, the third year of his animatronic existence. Billy's dad was still living with Billy and his mom then, and his dad said creation day was absurd. Billy's mom said it was very clever, and from that point on, Billy had creation days. The number of Billy's accumulated creation days 
was the subject of debate between Billy and his mom. She thought he was created five years before the number of years Billy had tallied. She told him that he'd started as a baby and lived for five years before he became an animatronic. Billy was able to find these years in his memory banks, but the images he had of those years were distorted, as if they belonged in some other animatronic. He concluded, after devoting much of his RAM to this issue, that the five years to which his mum referred were years during which Billy was being constructed. Given that his memory informed him he was complete on the day he watched Freddy and Friends and announced his existence as an animatronic, Billy believed his creation day was that day, not five years before. When he related this reasoning to his mum, she had nodded and said, we have to agree to disagree. Therefore, on Billy's 13th creation day, his mum celebrated his 18th creation day. Yeah, okay. Uh, so from the human perspective, the 18th creation day was a milestone. Accordingly, Billy's mum performed an elaborate celebratory ritual that included a happy creation day banner, 18 silver helium balloons, a variety of foods that fit Billy's animatronic dietary requirements, and a large cake, white with white froth frosting, per those animatronic requirements. Billy, his mum, and Dr. Lingstrom were the only participants in the ritual. They wore silver party hats, spe specially printed with the words, Happy Creation Day, and they sat at the kitchen table, eating the Creation Day meal. Billy, of course, acting no differently than usual. He never did. He was an animatronic. He didn't get excited about anything. His mum and Dr. Lingstrom didn't act excited either. They were quiet and sedate, even when they sang the usual Happy Creation Day song. Neither Billy's mum nor Dr. Lingstrom seemed to enjoy the meal. Billy didn't enjoy it either. It was just what his system required. Therefore, he ingested it. It had taken five years of experimentation for Billy to discover the appropriate foods for his animatronic system. During those years, he ate whatever his mum put on his plate. Like or dislike didn't come into the issue, although his taste sensors indicated some foods were better than others. After the five years testing foods, Billy had concluded that colour had no place in animatronic food. The colours in foods tended to overload his circuits, therefore he required all of his food to be white. White? Billy's mum had said the afternoon he'd informed her of his conclusion. She'd been fixing him his usual snack of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I will consume this sandwich, Billy had told her, because social convention dictates that I eat what you have already prepared. But, however, from this point forward, I require all white foods. White, his mum repeated. Animatronics do not efficiently digest colour, Billy told his mum. His mum had stood, walked to the refrigerator, and opened it. She spent several seconds staring at its contents. Then she did the same with the cabinets. When she turned around tears ran down her cheeks. Billy was aware that tears indicated sadness. He, therefore, processed the potential reasons for his mum's unhappiness. It took just a few seconds to conclude that she was unhappy because she didn't have the right foods. She would have to go out and buy them. Billy's mum did go out and buy the foods, and for the last eight years, Billy had eaten nothing but white foods. White flour-based breads and other baked goods, white rice, potatoes white pasta, white sauces, usually cheese-based, grits, cooked but not browned, chicken or fish or turkey, white mushrooms and onions, cauliflower and apples, peeled of course. Billy's mom was concerned that these foods didn't give Billy enough fibre. He researched the subject and discovered that fibre was something that he needed uh, for the digestive system. Because Billy's animatronic system was designed to be similar to a human's, Billy re reasoned he might require fibre too. He therefore asked his mum to purchase a powdered fibre supplement, white of course, which she dissolved in his water or his milk. The same year Billy reached conclusions about his diet, he settled on his appropriate wardrobe as well. Billy's clothing had been something of an issue for, uh, for some time. He had never thought the clothing his mum asked him to wear fit his animatronic presence. Yes, he knew that animatronics could and often did wear costumes, but Billy wanted to be a more autonomous animatronic. He wanted to be set on fire and sold to the world. <laughs> he wanted to dress up as a clown. Um, he required his own unique look. 
Since Billy knew himself to be made of metal, even if his external appearance didn't appear metallic, he reached the conclusion that various shades of silver and dark grey were required for his clothing. The lines of the clothing had, had to be simple, resembling the sleek, flat surfaces of metal. So, on Billy's 13th, 18th creation day, and his mom and Dr. Lingstrom ate white pasta with white sauce and cauliflower with homemade ranch dressing. It had to be homemade because the store brought variety had too many flecks of green. Billy was satisfied with the meal. The fact that his mom and Dr. Lingstrom left over half their small portions on their plates informed Billy that they found the meal less satisfying than he did. After the obligatory blowing out of the candles on the cake and opening of the presents, which included some additions to his silver and grey wardrobe, and a new laptop computer that his mom said would interface well with his internal processors, Billy thanked his mom and Dr. Lingstrom for the creation day celebration, and he left the kitchen to return to his private space in the basement. As Billy reached the door that opened onto the long, steep flight of stairs leading to his space, he learned he heard Dr. Lingstrom speak. Don't you think enough is enough, Vera? Dr. Lingstrom asked. He's 18. It's time for him to go into the group home. The one I told you about has a couple residents with severe delusions. One has lincan... Okay, I have to say this right. Lycanthropy. And one... I'm not putting him in a home, Billy's mom said. This is his home. Uh, by the way, lycanthropy, I know, is uh, people who believe they are werewolves. I believe. So you've had like a child who thought that he was an alien for a year and we've got loads of uh, residents that believe they are werewolves. <laughs> uh, but you've given up so much, Dr. Lingstrom said. You've lost your husband and your social life. You told me yourself that I'm your only remaining friend. And forgive me for being rude, but you don't look so good. You're losing your health too. You think I don't know all that? Billy's mum said. I know, but he's my son. Billy always felt a boost of energy through his systems when he heard his mum say, he's my son. It confirmed that he was still properly fulfilling his function as an animatronic designed to be a son. Once Billy's mum concluded her conversation with Dr. Lingstrom, Billy opened the door to the basement. He walked down the stairs to his base. Billy's move from his small bedroom to the larger and more secluded basement had occurred on his 17th, 12th creation day. That was the year he'd informed his mum that an animatronic required isolation and darkness for optimal recharging. Minimal auditory input was needed as well. Billy's bedroom, which was at the front of the house, was too near the street for quiet. Billy's auditory senses were always registering the passage of cars, the barking of dogs and the screaming of playing children. The basement, insulated by its thick cinder block walls and the earth that surrounded them, muffled much of the exterior sounds. In the basement, Billy's networks were given the silence necessary to shut down and reboot every day. When Billy set up his own personal recharge and service area in the basement, he'd done so with placid tranquility in mind. Removing the old shag brown carpeting and disposing of stored boxes and second-hand furniture, Billy had scrubbed the basement's cement floor and its cinder block walls. Both of these surfaces were naturally grey, so Billy didn't paint them. He moved his metal recharging platform to the basement and he requested that his mom buy him a metal table and chair for his information download section. This was where his computer and the books he was currently reading were kept. After his 13th, 18th creation day celebration, Billy went directly to his download station. He wanted to update his knowledge base to include the definition of lycanthropy. Oh, there we go. Not long after Billy's 13th creation day, on a morning that Billy's senses informed him was windy and rainy, Billy opened the door at the top of the basement stairs. He walked purposefully, as usual, to the kitchen to await the morning's hot cereal. When Billy left his recharging when sorry, when Billy left his charging station in the mornings to go to the kitchen for his morning nourishment, he always heard his mum moving around in the room. He would hear her clinking dishes or running water or closing cabinet doors. This morning, however, he didn't hear any of those. Billy's auditory senses reported to him the sound of the rain thrumming on the roof and the sound of heavy sheets of rainwater being slapped against the living room windows. From out in the street, he heard the shh of car tyres sl slicing through the rain on the pavement. But these sounds were all his senses were receiving. Billy, his systems flipping through subfolders to find a potential reason for his mum's silence, came up with no explanation for what he was hearing. 
or not hearing. He therefore walked into the kitchen to gather more data. Nothing in the kitchen, however, was useful. The kitchen looked as it always did, yellow and white, neat and tidy. From his reading, Billy had concluded that his mum was a good housekeeper. She kept everything clean and orderly. Still seeking data to explain the unusual morning, Billy opened the door leading into the garage. The family car was in the garage, his mum was not. Billy went down the hall to his mum's room. As it always did during the day, the door to her room stood open. When Billy looked in, he found the room empty, the bed made. Billy went down the hall to look in his mum's office. It too was as organised as always. All books and files stood neatly on white shelves or in white filing cabinets, and it too lacked his mum. Billy looked into his old bedroom. It was empty. He'd already looked into the living room and the dining room. This left the bathroom. Billy walked down the hall and hesitated in front of the bathroom door. One of Billy's larger subprograms was the one assigned to human manners and behaviour. In order to be a son, Billy had to properly perform a son's functions. This meant doing what human boys, and as the years went by teens, did properly. One of the things in this subroutine was the fact that it was wrong to walk in on your mum when she was in the bathroom. The bathroom door was closed because she wasn't in any other room in the house. Probably suggested his mum was in the bathroom. Billy knocked on the bathroom door. Mom? Billy called through the closed door. It is Billy. Are you coming to the kitchen to prepare my breakfast? Billy's mum did not answer. Billy's auditory processes were having trouble determining for certain because of the noise interference from the rain and wind, but no sounds seemed to be coming from the bathroom. If his mum was in the room, she was silent. Billy did a quick run through the systems assigned to unusual occurrences. These systems included subfolders filled with information on emergencies. Billy had gotten the information from several books. After shifting through his databanks, Billy concluded he had to enter the bathroom. His mum might need his help. Billy lifted a sturdy hand and knocked on the door again. When he received no response, he opened it. As soon as Billy opened the bathroom door, his senses were overwhelmed with a variety of input. Although part of the information was normal, his olfactory senses reported that the, loom, that the room had a lavender scent, which it always did after his mum was in the room, most of what his senses recorded were things he'd never encountered before. All this new information came through his visual senses. Billy's visual senses informed Billy that the gleaming white bathtub was filled with water, almost to the brim. Billy's mom was in the water, or more accurately, she was under the water. Billy could see his mom's face just beneath the surface of the still, clear liquid his mom's blonde hair wafted around her head, partially obscuring her staring eyes. Her body, unclothed, something Billy had never seen before, was limp. Billy's extensive reading had installed in his database what he needed to conclude that his mum was dead. But why? Billy had learned that humans always wanted to know why a person had died. Billy turned away from his mum's corpse and looked at the rest of the room. Outside, Thunder rumbled as Billy's senses registered an empty drinking glass on the grey granite counter by the sink. He noticed the open medicine cabinet. Billy reached a conclusion and filed the information in the appropriate file. He then did what his databases told him was the right thing to do in this situation. He left the bathroom and went to the phone to dial 911. So sad. So, honestly, so upsetting. I've got a tear on my eye. Oh. One of the things Billy's mum had downloaded into Billy's databases not long before she died was the imperative that Billy no longer inform people that he was an animatronic. Billy's robotic identity, she told him, must from that point on be a secret. I'm going to update your programming, his mum had told him. She picked up his silver hairbrush and began brushing Billy's thick brown hair. This was how Billy's mum always changed his programming. She had explained this to him the first year of his existence as an animatronic, when she brushed his hair, she told him his hardware received its updates. The update regarding Billy's secret robot identity had two parts. First, Billy was to keep his animatronic nature to himself. Second, he was to do his best to mimic normal human behaviour when he had to be around people. 
But I am an animatronic, Billy had said while his mum installed his new programming. I understand that, his mum had said. However, from now on, others don't need to know that. Because of this programming, Billy didn't inform the police and other officials who came in response to his 911 call that he was an animatronic. Some of them, however, already knew. The town Billy lived in was small, and he was the only animatronic living in it. Anyone who had lived in the town for long knew of Billy. The day Billy's mum died, though, no one spoke to him about what he was. Everyone who came to the house just went about their business and left, speaking to Billy very little. Only one young female EMT asked Billy if he was going to be alright. He'll be fine, Fran, another older EMT said, tugging on Fran's arm. Come on, let's get out of here. Billy's face recognition programming informed him that the older EMT was the father of a boy Billy used to call a friend. Billy considered telling the man to say hi to his son. This kind of communication was in Billy's social skills rub subroutines, which I need. Uh, <laughs> but he concluded that emergency situation protocols trumped social protocols. Billy said nothing as the EMTs left the house with his mum's body. He just closed and locked the door and went into the bathroom to clean it. That was what his mum would have wanted him to do. He then went down to the basement. He needed to interface with his computer so he could read the file that his mum had told him to read if she died. Billy sat in his gleaming silver metal chair and he accessed his, fro his computer's files. As he waited for the one that he wanted to open, his memory banks brought up the image of his mum telling him about the file. They'd been sitting at the table eating. Billy had been eating rice and chicken and cauliflower. His mum had been eating tiny bites of a package meal that she'd taken from the freezer and microwaved. At one point, Billy's mum had set down her fork. She turned and looked directly at Billy. Billy, there's something you need to add to your database, she had said. Billy had stopped eating. He'd focused on his mum's words so he could integrate whatever she said into his system. Before dinner, I emailed you a file, Billy's mum said. Her face scrunched up unusually for a moment. Then it returned to its most recent normal. She cleared her throat. You are not to open the file unless I am dead. She squinted at Billy. Does that compute? Billy nodded. Do not open the file unless you are dead. Billy's mum wiped her eyes. Right. Just download the file to your computer and keep it. If I die, read the file. It will have the next set of updates you'll need. Billy had nodded and given his mum his programmed polite response. Thank you, mum. Now Billy opened the file. The file was a big one. It took some time for Billy to read it. It was full of information Billy had not had before. It was useful information. Now that his mum was dead, the file informed Billy he had to be a different animatronic. He could no longer be an animatronic son. He had to be an animatronic adult. This required a completely different set of subroutines than the son animatronic had. His mum's file installed those subroutines. It gave him instructions on how to purchase what he needed to eat and care for at home. Uh, how to cook food, how to shop online, how to pay bills, how to hire people to take, take care of the house, the yard and the car. It informed him that he had a substantial financial account, an inheritance, that would fund his needs for the rest of his life. This had come from investments, something that Billy understood because he continued to read books on the subject after those first books were too old for him. Billy immediately began acting on his new programming. He became an animatronic adult. Over the next year, which Billy noted only because... Wait, over the next year, which Billy noted only because the other houses in his neighbourhood put out the lights on their trees, signifying the arrival of Christmas... Billy's adult animatronic existence was focused primarily on mastering his new programming. He had learned much, but he found that he needed to practice what he'd learned many times to become f proficient at executing it. Once Billy was comfortable with his new knowledge and skills, uh, he discovered that he was experiencing what felt like incoherence in his system. Billy's reading suggested that his incoherence might have been a condition called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, Billy had learned, was the mental unrest that occurred when a being, usually human, held conflicting beliefs or attitudes. The reason Billy concluded that he had this condition was that his senses were reporting to him two states of reality that were at odds with each other. Billy, being an animatronic, didn't exactly have beliefs or attitudes, but he did have a sense of self, 
and he was beginning to recognise that his sense of self was fractured. On the one hand, Billy knew himself to be a robot. On the other hand, his sensory experience of himself was that of a human being. In other words, Billy was a robot, but his physical systems were like those of a human. This was becoming more and more unsettling to Billy. He decided he had to do something about it. Billy's decision to create coherence was a catalyst for a lot of research over the coming days. How could, he co how could he create consistency between what he knew himself to be and what his senses reported him to be? After reading and exploring potential options, Billy concluded that he needed to replace his human appearing arms and legs with limbs that were more animatronic-like. From what Billy concluded based on his research, this meant he needed to switch out his current arms and legs for prosthetic arms and legs. This, Billy learned after even more research, required surgery. Thanks to his mom, Billy was familiar with seeking services from other humans. He knew how to use the computer. He knew how to use the computer to look for what he needed. He did this now, finding a list of surgeons in his area. Starting with the top name on the list, he dialed the assigned number. When a friendly woman's voice answered the phone, Billy stated his needs. Hello, my name is Billy. I am seeking a surgeon who will remove my arms and legs and replace them with the prosthetics. Billy's auditory senses registered the sound of a gasp coming through the phone. The woman, not sounding as friendly, asked, Why do you need all your limbs removed? Do you have a systematic infection? Billy ran this question through his processor. No, I have no infection. I have cognitive dissonance and my limbs are not consistent with my identity. Billy was careful not to say that his identity was animatronic, because he was still running his mum's programming regarding ki keeping his robotic nature a secret. A dial tone suddenly buzzed in Billy's ear. This informed him that the woman had hung up. Billy moved on to the next number. Forty minutes later, Billy had gone through every surgeon in the region surrounding his small town. He had received... Uh, he had received responses similar to the first one from every office he called. What was the next logical step? Billy got up and laid down on his recharging station. He felt like his systems were depleted. Perhaps when he rebooted, he would be able to find the surgeon he needed. The process that led Billy to a surgeon ended up being far more protracted than the steps of his original plan. This was because his current programming was deficient in the intricacies of how surgery and the medical system in general functioned. Billy had to access an extensive network of new databases before he located a surgeon who agreed to perform the required operations in a city within driving distance. Billy concluded, after an exhaustive search, that licensed surgeons would not perform the surgeries Billy required. Logically, Billy decided this meant that an unlicensed surgeon might be able to provide the needed service. Accordingly, Billy began searching for such a surgeon, searching for a su such a surgeon, sorry, and he found one, a disreputable uh, doctor who had lost his license because of malpractice lawsuits related to unspecified substance abuse and health issues. He was willing to do any surgeries asked of him if the fee satisfied him. When Billy's data downloads led him to the man, just call me Doc. The fee requested was well within the budget Billy had assigned to his project. This isn't going to happen overnight, you know, Duck told Billy over the phone after he agreed to proceed with Billy's plan. Doc coughed heavily. Every time we lop off a limb, your body will need time to recover. You won't be able to be fitted with a prosthetic until the stump is healed. Doc coughed again. The sound was loud and crackly to Billy's auditory processes. Y'all need someone to help you while you heal. Duck went on. And when you get your prosthetic, you'll need physical therapy to adapt to it. I will not require healing time or therapy, Billy told the doctor. What? Are you superhero human or something? Doc asked. Billy wanted to explain that he was an animatronic, but that would have gone against his programming. Therefore, he just said... I am Billy, and I will adapt easily. Doc laughed, which triggered a cascade of coughing. Finally, he said, Yeah, well, humor an old man. I'm going to set up the back room and call in my squeeze Norma to take care of you if you need it. Norma's retired, used to be a nurse. Sometimes she helps me out. She can do it all, recovery and physical therapy. Doc laughed in a way Billy had never heard before. 
The sound was similar to that of a machine gun fire Billy's auditory sensor had picked up from the TV. Multi-talented, my Norma, Doc said. Doc gave Billy an address, and Billy told Doc he would arrive the next day. Doc coughed again and said, I'll be waiting. Billy was an animatronic, so he was never thankful, but he was able to experience a lot of satisfaction when the information he needed was right there when he needed it. He received this satisfaction the next day when he went out to the garage and got in the family station wagon. Because of Billy's mom, Billy was able to drive the old station wagon that sat in his garage. His mom had added this skill to his database two years before his 13th creation day. Billy had not used the skill often since he'd acquired it, but he was easily able to call up the appropriate functions when he got in the station wagon to head to the city to see Doc. By the time Billy passed the junkyard that sat at the edge of his town, Billy was confident that he was in satisfactory control of the vehicle, and he was right. The drive to the city went smoothly, and Billy found Doc's location easily. Like Billy, Doc lived in a basement. Unlike Billy's though, Doc was under a under seven floors of an empty old brick building that used to be a mental hospital. Doc had laughed and laughed when he'd told Billy this. Billy was unable to figure out, from his available knowledge, why this was so funny. When skinny and grey-haired Doc met Billy outside the dirty building with the boarded up windows and the crumbling concrete steps, Doc told Billy he owned the building. Doc waved at the building with a hand that shook slightly. He coughed as he said, Got it cheap because no one else wants it. Don't keep it up, so it's easy to maintain. Doc had Billy park his car behind the building. Then Doc led Billy into the building through a grey metal door. Billy thought the door was appropriate for the entrance to a place where an animatronic would receive service. Once inside the building, Doc led Billy down a long flight of dust-covered and trash-littered stairs. Billy's visual sensors registered a small rodent. Probability predicted a rat scuttling along the landing as they passed it. Although Billy's research regarding surgery had inputted into his system images of clean and modern surgical suites and equipment, Doc's premises didn't concern Billy. Billy was an animatronic. He didn't require perfect conditions for servicing. Doc led Billy to a small room with no windows. The room had peeling beige paint and one narrow metal framed bed with a thin mattress. It wasn't a traditional charging platform, but it would suffice. Are you sure you want to do this? Doc asked Billy as Billy inspected the room. Billy rotated to gaze at Doc. I have chosen a course of action. That is the right one for me. Doc chuckled. Okie dokie, whatever floats your boat. Got the money? Billy handed over the cash Doc had requested. I can't do the accent anymore that I was doing before. I've completely forgotten what I was doing. So I'm just going to give him like a Scottish accent or something. I don't know. We'll get it done first thing in the morning, Doc said. Oh god, that's so much better. <laughs> uh, Billy was an animatronic. He didn't get excited, but he registered something that might have been anticipation that night before he lay down on the yellowing bare mattress to recharge his systems. Billy's anticipation did not correlate with the events that unfolded after his first surgery. The information he'd inputted into his database, he concluded, had been lacking. As an animatronic, Billy did not experience pain. However, he did have tactile sensors that reported pain-like awareness from time to time. Not long after his second creation day, for example, Billy had fallen in front of his house. He had skinned his knee. It was interesting to experience the sing stinging sensation and watch the blood flow from his skin as tears had leaked from his eyes. Billy had chosen, sorry, Billy had not chosen any of these reactions. He had to assume they were programmed. The blood and tears were not welcome. They were inconsistent with the being the kind of animatronic that Billy wanted to be. Billy was not expecting what his programming had in store after Doc removed Billy's left leg. The pain-like awareness and the flows of blood that he experienced were far greater than that of the skinned knee. Billy discovered that he was programmed to cry and yell out when his thigh reported to him sensations that he defined, based on his reading, as agony. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! Agony! <laughs> oh boy. Agony's coming back, isn't it? Oh no. He also discovered that his programming allowed the raw and bloody tissues that made up his stump to become inflamed with infection. 
This resulted in a cascade failure of many of Billy's systems. His temperature rose quite high, his digestive system shut down, his neuroprocessing capabilities were compromised. Fortunately, all this wasn't permanent. White-haired, heavily tanned, and large-handed Norma, who took care of Billy after the surgery, told Billy that he bounced back pretty quickly, all things considered. Billy was not able to determine what that meant, but Norma did tell him after four weeks that he was ready to be fitted with his first prosthetic. Doc had ordered all Billy's prosthetics using the money that Billy gave him. Billy had shown him a picture of dark grey metal and plastic prosthetics. Those were the ones that Billy required. Billy's visual sensors reported to Billy that the look of his new prosthetic leg was acceptable. The feel of it, as reported by his tactile sensors, was not. After doing this research, Billy had projected that his new prosthetic limb would make him stronger and faster. It would make him a better animatronic. Billy's research, however, must have been inaccurate or incomplete. The prosthetic not only did not increase his strength or speed, it did the opposite. Billy found that his ability to get around was greatly compromised by the new metal and plastic leg. Although it was strong on its own, the metal and plastic limb lacked efficiency when combined with the stump left at the top of Billy's old and no longer their leg. Billy's gait, which had been previously smooth and upright, became hesitant and faltering. Billy told Doc the result had not been what he expected. No refunds, Doc said, but we can stop with one leg. You want to call it quits? No, I do not, Billy said. I have concluded that this unsatisfactory movement is the result of the partially finished servicing. After the other limbs have been replaced, I will function correctly. Doc laughed, coughed and said, whatever you say, kid. Although Billy wanted to go ahead immediately with the next limb replacement, Doc refused. I don't care what you say, kid, Doc said. Your body needs time to heal and adjust to the shock before we move on. Billy opened his mouth to object, but Doc held up a hand. Yeah. I know you're different, but what I say goes. If you kick the bucket because we push it, I don't get my whole fee. Doc cackled. Billy had discovered that the right word for his funny laugh was cackle. Go home, Doc said. Get used to this new leg. Come back in a few months if you still want to go ahead with it. We'll do the next one. He coughed and wiped his thin mouth with the back of his shaky hand. Because Billy knew that Doc was the only surgeon who would do what Billy wanted, he was forced to go along with Doc's plan. After spending six weeks with Doc and Norma, Billy got in his car and drove home. The drive home was harder than the drive to Doc's. The new limb made working the pedals awkward. Billy was relieved when he passed the junkyard. It meant he was just a couple miles from his house. As he drove by the mountains of discarded rubbish and the rusted and crushed vehicles, Billy's processors conjured an image of Billy's rejected parts tossed in among the debris. The thought satisfied him for some reason. It made him feel like he was on his way to becoming the whole and complete animatronic he wanted to be. Yes, my friends, this is, in fact, an Eleanor origin story. You are welcome. <laughs> that was a joke. That, that was a joke. <laughs> that is genuinely what I thought when I first read the leaks. Like, they mentioned a junkyard, and I was instantly like, no way, no shot, this is an Eleanor-centric story, right? <laughs> I did think for a second, like, B7, Eleanor, oh my gosh, it's coming together. Anyway, after Billy's first leg replacement, Billy learned that his basement recharging area was no longer going to suit him. The long flight of stairs was too difficult to negotiate with the new prosthetic leg. Accordingly, Billy hired a moving service to remove his parents' bedroom furniture and bring up Billy's metal platform, table and chair from the basement. These were placed in the now empty bedroom. Because this bedroom, unlike Billy's old room, was at the back of the house, Billy's auditory sensors could handle the noise level. Plus, even if the noise level, noise level sorry, wasn't ideal, Billy's olfactory sensors provided feedback that made the room more than satisfactory. They reported the scent of lavender, something that triggered in Billy's memory banks images of his mom. The images compensated for any increase in the noise level over that of the basement. Besides, the most important reason for using this room as his recharging area was that it removed the need for negotiating stairs. Billy's second limb replacement was, ha was his left arm. That went better than the first one. Billy found that this substitute arm, though not as efficient as his original one, functioned well enough to allow Billy to perform his daily tasks. The third limb replacement, the second leg, however, was even less satisfactory than the first and second surgeries. With both original legs gone, 
Billy discovered that he was weaker and less coordinated than ever. Billy also began experiencing pain-like sensations con constantly. At the junction between his remaining flesh and bone and the prosthetic connections, Billy's tactile sensors, sensors reported a chronic burning ache. They also reported erroneously similar reactions in the missing limbs. Billy knew that his new limbs had no tactile sensors, so he should feel nothing from them, but he did. The resulting abundance of pain-like sensory input was more than a little dis distracting. Why was this project failing to meet Billy's expected goals? Was Doc the problem? Billy used all his computing capacity to tackle these questions. In the end, he determined that Doc, although old and shaky and not as clean as a normal surgeon would be, was not the problem. The problem had to be, Billy concluded, his own shortcomings. Billy hoped the last limb replacement would remove all the problems he was having with his updated endoskeleton. But it did not. It simply added to his overall lack of coordination and weakness, and it exasper exacerbated... Exasperated. Is it exasperated? No, that's not exasperated. Exacerbated the overabundance of input from his tactile senses. Sorry, I can't read English, apparently. Two days after Billy's 15th creation day, Doc drove Billy home following Billy's last limb replacement. Doc drove because Billy's new arms and legs did not make safe driving possible. Norma followed the station wagon in an old battered... In a, sorry, in a battered old white pickup, so she could take Doc back to the city after he left Billy at his house. Once inside his home again, Billy jerked his way through the living room and lurched into the kitchen. His progress was slow and destructive. He gouged the walls, knocked over two lamps, and scraped the hardwood floors along the way. And uh, for all you theorists out there, I'm going to say the next line, and something might come to mind. I am not going to spoil that because I'm going to be doing a theory video on it. When Billy reached the kitchen, he fumbled for a glass and dropped it. The glass shattered. Shards went everywhere. Think about what that means. Think about that. Okay, I'll move on. <laughs> Billy managed to open a different cabinet. He got out the plastic cup. Slopping water all over the place, Billy filled the cup halfway. He lunged over to the table and dropped into a chair. There, he applied all his processing capacity to his problem. Billy had to accept the failure of his endeavour. The reality was that although Billy was replacing his limbs, there was still a vast disconnect between his animatronic nature and his body's more human-like systems. He had to find a way to remedy these inconsistencies. The day after Doc returned to Billy, with all new limbs, to Billy's house, Billy spent hours online researching his options for further modifications. In the course of this research, he happened upon an online chat room for people who weren't satisfied with their physical appearance. In the chat room, he met Malaya. Billy had never encountered the name Malaya, so he asked Malaya what her name meant. It's a Hawaiian name, Malaya responded. My mum told me it means of the sea. My dad said it means bitter. Figures he'd say that he wasn't a nice man. Since his seventh creation day, Billy had engaged in only minimal interaction with anyone other than his mum or Dr. Lingstrom, and after his mum had died, Billy didn't see Dr. Lingstrom either. This lack of contact with people wasn't a problem. However, Billy discovered that his neural networks expanded greatly as a result of his interactions with Malaya. He was so satisfied, in fact, by his communications with Malaya, that he stopped researching further physical enhancements. He wanted to integrate what he was learning about interpersonal communication. My dad hit me all the time, Malaya typed on the second night that she and Billy chatted online. So of course, I went and got in the relationship with a jerk who picked up where my dad left off. Billy found Malaya's words challenging. She used a lot of vernacular and cliches that Billy had to look up. His contact with her vastly expanded his vocabulary of casual slang. After that, Malaya wrote, I just ping-ponged from one abusive jerk to the next. I am so sorry, Billy typed back. He was reasonably certain this was the right response. Malaya responded with a smile emoticon. Billy deduced that he'd gotten it right. After that, Malaya typed, Are you an abusive jerk? She put a winking emoticon after the question. Billy wasn't sure how to interpret that. Uh, he decided to answer the question honestly. I am not an abusive... <laughs> I am not an abusive jerk, 
Malaya sent him a laughing emoticon. Was that good? This type of interaction was quite stimulating to Billy's processors. It required that he use his databases in ways he'd never used them before. Why are you in this chat room? Malaya typed next. What do you want to change about your body? Billy had to think about this question. He was still running his secret robot programming. He couldn't tell her the truth, not all of it anyway. Billy typed, I want my body to match who I really am on the inside. Oh, that's cool, Malaya typed. Me too. On the inside, I'm a beach babe. On the outside, I'm pudgy and have a flat face. I want liposuction and cheek sculpting and a nose job. Billy did not know how to respond to this. His social subroutines informed him that commenting on a girl's appearance was quite complex. It's too true. Uh, he could easily cause hurt feelings if he responded incorrectly. Malaya saved his circuits when she didn't wait for a response. What work do you want done? Malaya's desire for cheek sculpting had triggered a conclusion in Billy's processes. I want facial sculpting too, Billy typed. Metal plates, Billy realised. This was what he needed next. Now that he looked very much like his dad... Wait, hang on. Now that he looked very much like his dad had when his dad left, Billy understood that the curves of his face were not remotely consistent with an animatronic appearance. If he could have metal plates implanted under his skin, however, his face would take on the angular planes he thought were more in keeping with his animatronic figure. Billy wanted to stop chatting with Malaya so he could call Doc to talk about this new idea. Malaya, however, was typing again. Do you want to meet in person? She asked. Billy thought about this. It could be interesting, he concluded. Yes, I do. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. This story is so good. I'm loving it. I love this story so much. Okay, 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 okay. As Malaya pulled up to the small house set in a row of similar houses, she asked herself for at least the 20th time if she'd lost her mind. She was about to meet a guy she met online. She'd agreed to meet him at his house. Was she insane? He could be a serial killer. And she was about to serve himself up to him like a juicy roast. Malaya let her car idle as she craned her neck to look through the passenger window. She studied the house. It looked okay, she figured. The yard was neat. The lawn was green and mowed and the bushes were trimmed. The house had clean white siding. The windows were sparkling. It didn't look like the lair of a serial killer. But then, what did a serial killer's lair look like? I'll just get on with it, Malaya told herself. If he kills you, it will save you money in surgeries. You won't have to try to look good enough for someone better than a serial killer. Malaya snorted at a dumb joke. She got out of the car and treaded briskly up the walk before she could talk herself out of what she was doing. Standing on a white painted porch, Malaya took a deep breath. She rang the doorbell. The door opened almost immediately. Billy must have been watching for her. As soon as the door opened, Malaya put on her best smile and hoped Billy would see her even white teeth instead of her wide nose and her double chin. She'd taken care with her eye makeup and she knew her eyes were her best feature. So she felt pretty good about her big brown eyes. Her chestnut coloured Hawaiian skin was a positive too. She had a great complexion. Hopefully he'd focus on that as well. The first thing Malaya registered when she looked up at the, man, at the man standing in front of her was that he was tall. He towered over her. The second thing she noticed was that he had a really cute face. That was a surprise. Yes, his cheeks were a bit chipmunky. Maybe that was why he wanted some facial, facial sculpting done. But all in all, he was pretty good looking. Malaya dropped her gaze to check out Billy's body. Her smile faltered. The man standing before her wore a short sleeve grey shirt and extending from the open sleeves were two grey prosthetic arms that ended in prosthetic hands with articulated fingers. Arms, plural. Both of his arms were artificial. Wow. Why hadn't Billy mentioned he was missing his arms? It was so... heartrending. Malaya's eyes moistened. She blinked, hoping Billy hadn't seen her pity. She smiled at him. He needed someone to accept him as he was, not feel sorry for him. She could give him that acceptance. This was a man who needed her. She liked that idea. But should she say anything about the prosthetics? Should she ask what happened? Hello, Billy said. I am happy that you are here. 
Billy's voice didn't match his words. His voice was flat and lacked inflection. It was like the voice of a robot. Although Malaya hadn't said anything yet, Billy spoke again. You look very nice, he said. That is a pretty purple dress. Malaya looked back up to Billy's face. He was smiling at her as if he was pleased with what, she, with what he saw. That made her feel good. And she was happy she could see his smile because the flat tone of his voice belied his words and expression. He sounded a little robotic, but no one could help how they sounded. Malaya found her own voice. Um, hi, she said. She didn't mention his arms. Please come in, Billy said. I ordered a white cake. White is the only colour I eat. I used to bake my own cakes, but my new limbs do not work satisfactorily. Billy raised his arms and then gestured at his legs. He stepped back from the door in an awkward backward uh, lunge-like move. Malaya looked down at Billy's legs. Billy's legs were hidden under a pair of grey slacks, but the slacks were tight enough to reveal the unnatural outlines of his limbs. Were Billy's legs prosthetic too? Malaya couldn't contain herself. She blurted the question. Billy nodded placidly. I had my limbs re replaced. The result was not as I expected it would be, but I am adapting. Malaya teared up again. She wiped her eyes, stepped forward, and put her hand on Billy's shoulder. I really admire your attitude. You're very brave. What an amazing man, Malaya thought. Most men would be resentful or angry if they'd gone through whatever it was Billy had gone through. But Billy obviously didn't feel sorry for himself at all. Instead of acting like a victim, he was being the perfect gentleman. How cool was that? Every other guy Malaya had been with had acted like a smartass from the get-go. No wonder they'd been losers. They'd never treated her with respect. Billy was treating her with respect. Limpless and flat-voiced or not, Billy was better than the guys that Malaya had dated up until now. Malaya's smile widened. It's nice to see you, Billy. I'm happy to be here. Malaya entered Billy's house, and she was glad to see that it looked as nice on the inside as it did on the outside. A guy who could keep a clean house. Go figure. She was also delighted and surprised that she enjoyed the two hours she spent having white cake and milk in Billy's spotless kitchen. When Malaya left Billy, she promised she'd come back again, and she intended to keep the promise. In the past, she probably would have given Billy a pass. His android-like voice was a little disconcerting, and his lack of limbs made him pitch and reel all over the place when he walked, like he was walking on the deck of a ship in a tropical storm. But Malaya had learned the hard way that the superficial stuff didn't matter as much as the stuff you couldn't see. In spite of his obvious limitations, Billy had had two qualities Malaya really liked. Three, actually. One, he listened when she talked. He really listened. His gaze never left her face when she spoke, as if what she was saying was the most important thing in the world. Two, when, she, when he talked, he was interesting. He was obviously well-read. That was a nice change of pace from the idiots Malaya usually went out with. And three, he was nice to her. He was very kind. Malaya figured she could do worse. In fact, she already had done worse. Much, much worse. The addition of Malaya in Billy's life took up a lot of his time. This, concluded, was a, this, he concluded, was a good thing. It expanded his knowledge base even more. It gave him a new purpose as well. After Malaya's third visit to his house, Malaya asked him what he was to her. This was a baffling question at first. Malaya was many things. She was a human. She was a woman. She was a visitor in Billy's house. What did she mean? What was the right response? This is why Billy asked this was why Billy liked his time with Malaya. She forced him to think in ways his processes had never thought in before. Before Billy had to attempt a reply, Malaya clarified her question. I mean, are we just friends or am I your girlfriend? Her face flushed a little. Billy knew that flushed faces could mean embarrassment. He didn't want Malaya to be embarrassed. His reading had indicated that humans didn't like being embarrassed. You are my girlfriend, Billy said. This was true. She was a girl and she was his friend. <laughs> Sorry, that made me laugh a lot. Um, Malaya gave Billy a huge smile. Then she leaned in and kissed him right on the mouth. Billy's neuroprocessing system concluded two things from the kiss. One, kissing was an experience worth having more than once. Second, Malaya was indeed Billy's girlfriend. He found this satisfying. As satisfying as having a girlfriend was, however, Billy still was unsettled by his failure to live up to his robotic potential. 
he needed to continue with his self-improvement plan. To that end, he called Doc. Hey, kid, Doc said after coughing into Billy's auditory senses. How are the new limbs? My improved limbs have not improved me as much I expected them to, Billy said. I require additional work. Doc coughed again. What do you want now? Much as I have no trouble taking your money, you don't have any more appendages to swap out. An angular facial structure would be more consistent with my internal nature, Billy said. I require metal plates implanted over my cheekbones under the skin to achieve that structure. Doc coughed, then breathed heavily, heavily into the phone for a few seconds. Yeah, okay, I can do that. Doc named a fee. Billy agreed to it. They also agreed on a date. Billy called Malaya. I am leaving to have surgery in two days. I will contact you when I get back. Oh, okay, Malaya said. Do you want me to come with you? No, thank you, Billy said. Actually, Billy would have been okay with Malaya's company, but Doc had inputted it into Billy's system instructions, similar to those of Billy's mom. Billy was not to tell anyone about Doc or the surgeries he did in the basement of the old mental hospital. Doc's work and his address were both secrets. Okay, call me when you get back, Malaya said. I'll come take care of you. That sounds nice. Thank you, Billy said. It was a week before Billy could call Malaya. After the surgery, Billy's face swelled up to twice its normal size. The incisions Doc made in Billy's cheeks wouldn't stop bleeding, and they leaked a greenish pus that Norma said they had to stop before Billy could go home. Norma made Billy swallow a lot of antibiotics, and she changed the gauze dressings on his face multiple times before finally agreeing that Doc could take Billy back to his house. Billy, checking the results of the latest procedure in the mirror, thought the metal plates were 50% effective and pretty 50% ineffective. They did make his face squarer and more animatronic-like. However, they also left him with jagged and livid red scars that were more reminiscent of a monster than they were of a robot. These scars also added to the already copious amount of his pain-like sensations. He had to research more options. He hadn't yet achieved his goal. Malaya apparently agreed with Billy's assessment. When she arrived that evening to take care of Billy, the smile she wore when, she, when he opened the door disappeared the instant that she looked at him. Oh, she said. I am not done yet, Billy said. The next set of modifications will get me closer to my goal. Malaya didn't come in the house when Billy opened the door wider. She covered her mouth and blinked rapidly. Are you coming in? Billy asked. Malaya took a deep breath. I think you need your incisions cleaned. Malaya came into the house, but she barely glanced at Billy as she passed him and went into the kitchen. Billy closed the front door and started following Malaya. Even though Billy had been practicing walking with his prosthetics, he still didn't move as fast as Malaya did. She was in the kitchen running water when he got to the doorway, and she was talking to herself. What was he thinking? she muttered. His face isn't cute anymore. Billy found this statement helpful. It suggested that he was closer to his goal than he thought he was. He didn't want to be cute. He wanted to be robotic. Oh no, Billy. Billy, go back to your innocent childlike self. <laughs> oh. Although Malaya didn't come over as often as Billy modified his face, she still talked to him frequently. They were on the phone nearly every day. Even so, Billy didn't tell Malaya when he made arrangements with Doc to have the whites of his eyes dyed black. It's a dangerous and painful procedure, kid, Doc said the day after Billy proposed the idea. I looked into it, and I can do it, but I can't use the usual an anaesthetic because of potential toxic interactions. Are you sure? I am sure, Billy said. A week later, Doc picked Billy up and took him back to the basement of the abandoned mental hospital. There, Doc used the needles to insert black dye into the irises and whites of Billy's eyes. Blech. I hate it so much, I don't like people touching their eyes. Um... The injections triggered Billy's sensory processes, which activated his vocal systems. Billy screamed during the entire procedure. When Billy returned home, he was gratified by what he saw in the mirror. This procedure was the most successful so far. His eyes, as he intended them to be, were now pitch black. Billy called Malaya and asked her to come and see his eyes. She didn't sound enthusiastic about the idea, but she agreed. When Malaya arrived and looked at Billy... She seemed happier with his eyes than she had been with his facial plates. Looking up at his eyes, Malaya was pretty short, Malaya said, Well, I miss your big brown eyes, but I have to admit, that looks kind of cool. 
sort of vampirish. Billy wasn't sure that vampirish was good. He was a robot, not a vampire. He had to counter this result. <laughs> I love this. I love this. He's just waiting for Malaya to say, you look like a robot, and then Billy will be satisfied. But he, she's not going to say that. Billy did more, some more research. He concluded that, get, that removing his tongue would get him closer to being a true animatronic. He could still communicate, he learned, if he had a vocal synthesizer implanted in his throat. When Billy called Doc and explained what he wanted, Doc coughed and said, whatever you want. Malaya, however, wasn't pleased with Billy's new upgrade. She came over to see Billy the day he got back from Doc's, and she gasped when Billy opened his mouth and showed her the absence of his tongue. Why? Malaya cried out. To activate the synthesi- this, yeah. Now I need to get my tongue cut out. Uh, to activate the synthesizer, Billy had to type his intended communication on his computer. I am no longer... I messed it up completely. I no longer needed my tongue. A synthesizer is far preferable. Malaya opened and closed her mouth. Then she burst into tears and ran out of Billy's house. He decided Malaya wasn't as satisfied as he was with his latest improvement. The next day, Malaya called. I'm very sorry I ran away, she said. Billy typed in. That is alright. You're just not capable of understanding. It's not your fault. All humans are limited. He had almost typed in what he was an anima he had almost typed in that he was an animatronic and he had to make the improvements he was making so he could be a better animatronic. But he couldn't go against his programming. Instead, he told her what he was going to have done next. Doc will be removing my ears next week, Billy said through his new synthesizer. What? Malaya shrieked. How were you here? I am only having my cartridge projecting from the sides of my head removed. All auditory sensors will remain intact. But you have nice ears, Malaya said. Ears are inconsistent with the essence of what I am, Billy said. Malaya didn't speak. Billy could hear her breathing into the phone. Call me when you get back, she said quietly. I will do that, Billy said. And he did. Malaya came over to see him the next day. When she looked at him, Malaya chewed on her lower lip. That doesn't look all that great now, she said as she glanced at the su sutures, <laughs> kinching up Doc's incisions. But after the hair grows back around them, it won't be all that noticeable. Oh wait, no, that wasn't Billy speaking, that was Malaya. <laughs> Malaya is now a robot, everyone. Uh, but after the hair grows back around them, it won't be all that noticeable. I want you to shave my head after the incisions heal, Billy said. Malaya walked away from Billy and sat on the other side of the room. She stared at him for several seconds. Finally, Malaya spoke. Her voice was unsteady. Are you done now? Nothing else. Billy shook his head. I am not done. I have some other unnecessary parts that need to be removed. Malaya blinked. Unnecessary parts, she repeated. Billy nodded. He considered explaining the procedure to Malaya, but perhaps that was inadvisable. Malaya stood. I need to go, Billy. Billy nodded. All right. Malaya walked over to Billy and tipped her head back as if she intended to kiss him. She closed her eyes and leaned toward him. Then she suddenly pulled back. She opened her eyes and stepped away. She lifted her hand to wave at him and she left his house. Billy didn't see Malaya anymore after that. He talked to her on the phone again, though. He called her the day he decided to change his name. Hi, Billy, Malaya said when, she, when he called. She didn't sound like she normally sounded. The way she sounded brought up an image from Billy's memory banks, an image of the way his mom had sounded in the days before her death. From now on, Billy said, I would like to be called B7. It's a name more in keeping with my true nature. Malaya didn't respond. B7 heard a click, and then he heard the phone's dial tone. B7 didn't call Malaya again until he had the last of his exterior changes done. A couple weeks after the last surgery, however, he picked up the phone and dialed her number. Hello, Malaya answered. Hello, Malaya. It's B7. I am calling to see if you would join me in the celebration of my 16th 
what my mum would have said was my 21st creation day. You can help me blow out candles. Malaya was silent for a few seconds. Then she said, I'm sorry, but I'm busy. B7 heard a click and the phone's dial tone. On the morning of B7's 16th creation day, B7 got up and prepared to put on his grey pants and grey shirt. Before he pulled them on, though, he felt, com he felt compelled to go into his old room and look into the full-length mirror on the back of the door. He wanted to see the results of all the work he'd done to become consistent with his true self. He thought seeing the totality of his efforts would be a fitting way to celebrate the day. When B7 faced himself in the mirror, something quite surprising happened. B7 no longer wanted to have a creation ritual. Gazing at the prosthetics strapped to his four stumps, the bright red lumpy scars on his face and on the sides of his head where his ears used to be, the inky blackness of his eyes and the tongueless maw of his mouth, B7 got a sudden download of information. The download was system-wide, and it was shocking. No, it was horrifying. B7 realised that he was not B7. Billy's prosthetic legs went out from under him. He collapsed to the floor. He started to cry as he was overwhelmed by an avalanche of memories and realisations. Mental images and sounds and words assaulted Billy, and the result completely reconfigured his perceptions. In a mind-blowing instant, Billy saw himself not as the ideal animatronic he'd been trying to be, but as the complete failure of the man he'd now never be. From deep inside Billy, a ragged wail erupted. The sound was guttural and garbled, but Billy more felt it than heard it. The keening tore up from within so violently that it felt like his emotions were trying to rip through his throat. Billy had no one to comfort him as the self-image he'd held for 16 years shattered around him. If his mum had still been here, she'd have hugged him and told him it was okay, because he was her son, but she was gone. Malaya was gone too. Billy wriggled onto his side and curled himself into the tightest ball he could manage. He cringed at the way all his modifications prodded and poked at his remaining tender skin. It felt like every nerve ending in his body was on fire, screaming in rage and pain. His chest heaved, his heart pounded, his head was suddenly so pressurised that it felt like it was going to explode. For a long time, Billy lay on the floor and struggled to breathe. He cried, and he cried, and he cried. Eventually, his body couldn't produce any more tears. His breathing quieted. He was spent. Billy stretched out his prosthetic legs and tried to stand, but he couldn't. He had to crawl out of his old room and down the hall to his parents' bedroom. Billy dragged himself over to the metal platform he'd been forcing himself to sleep on for so many years. The platform was cold and hard. Billy grabbed the edges of it and pulled himself upright. Jerking across the room to the computer, Billy sat in his metal chair and linked his computer to his phone so he could use his synthesizer to communicate. Wiping his wet, cube-shaped face with the back of his prosthetic hand, Billy called Doc. Can you undo what I've done? Billy asked Doc. Doc laughed so hard that he triggered a coughing fit, which went on for several seconds. Finally, he said, Sorry, kid. No can do. Another of Doc's laughs, uh, coughs racked him. When the cough ended, Doc spoke one last time. Good luck, kid. Doc hung up. Billy set the phone down but he didn't disconnect it. He let the dial tone buzz until the recorded voice urged him to hang up the phone. He ignored the voice until it went silent. When the phone went silent, Billy didn't move. He couldn't move. He, he couldn't move. All he could do was sit and stare straight ahead. Billy wasn't aware of how long he sat and stared until he blinked and noticed the room was getting darker. He looked at the clock on his computer. He had been sitting in his chair for most of the day. Painfully, Billy got up. He now knew what he needed to do. Billy limped to his parents' closet. There, Billy pushed aside his own clothes and looked at the clothes, uh, looked at the few clothes his dad hadn't taken when he'd left. Billy was the same size as his dad. He reached for a pair of his dad's jeans and one of his dad's shirts, a green one. After struggling, 
into the clothes. Billy went out to the living room. In the living room, Billy looked at the big plush grey sofa he hadn't used in years. The sofa was the same sofa his parents had sat on the night Billy had announced that he was an animatronic. Billy closed his eyes and he could see his parents, side by side, behind his little five-year-old self. Billy stumbled to the sofa and collapsed on it. It was soft and it embraced him like no human arms ever would again. Billy stayed on the sofa as the rest of the light faded from the day. He stayed on the sofa until the old dog across the street started barking. He stayed as dusk gave way to darkness. He stayed on the sofa for a while longer. Finally, Billy levered himself to his prosthetic feet. He walked to the front door and went out into the night. Billy hadn't driven since his last limb amputation. He'd never been able to get his prosthetics to work together to operate the pedals and the steering wheel and the gear shift at the same time. He had, however, gotten better at walking. Ungainly and faltering, Billy's walk was more of a herky-jerky wobble than a walk, but it moved him forward. So Billy walked away from his house and headed down the sidewalk. Billy didn't know what time it was now, but he knew it was late. No cars were moving on the streets. All the houses were dark, but for the occasional porch light throwing long yellow glowing fingers across shadow-shrouded yards. Thick grey clouds had descended on the town just before dusk, and they'd stayed. It was a moonless and starless night. The sky was a black tent pitched over the town. Billy walked on. He didn't know where he was going when he set out. All he'd been trying to do was get away from his life. He'd been attempting to escape the nightmare he'd created for himself. When Billy reached where he was going though, he realised it was the right place. It was the only place. Billy walked up to the bent and rusted chain link fence that surrounded his destination. His prosthetic hands gripped the links. He looked past the fence. Beyond the fence lay the junkyard that Billy had gone past so many times, on his way to and from Doc's old mental hospital. The junkyard, now sitting in feeble light, cast from a couple, barely flickering, security fixtures, was a place for discarded rubbish. Yes, this was the right place. Billy followed the fence line for several feet, and he found a spot where the chain link fence bulged outward. He turned sideways and wedged himself through the narrow opening. Inside the fence, Billy started wandering up and down the rows of derelict vehicles and old battered appliances. At the end of one row, he spotted a station wagon similar to the one that still sat in his garage. The station wagon was tucked into the metal enclosure of a car compactor. The enclosed space appealed to Billy. It looked like a little steel fort. Billy veered toward the car. Grabbing the back door handle, Billy pulled on it. The rusted metal door caught and creaked in protest, but Billy was able to wrench it open. He crawled inside the car, and for the first time in 16 years, Billy, the human, curled up on his side and went to sleep. The clouds that had obscured the moon and stars were gone when Billy woke up. At first, Billy thought the piercingly bright sun had awakened him, but then he realised that it wasn't light that had intruded into his sleep. It was sound and vibration. A loud engine was rumbling. Metal was crunching and pinging and snapping, and the station wagon was juddering as if caught in an earthquake. Cringing, Billy raised his head just enough to peer through the dirty back window of the station wagon Beyond the edge of the compactor's enclosure, a man stood at the control panel. Before the man spotted Billy, Billy ducked his head down. He pressed himself against the station wagon's back seat. It was in a shadow. Billy didn't think anyone would see him there. Billy closed his eyes and waited. His wait wasn't long. A humming roar began, and the station wagon's exterior began to crunch inward with a high-pitched metallic screech. Billy opened his eyes. The station wagon's roof was coming down toward Billy. Even though Billy had feelings now because he was no longer an animatronic, the collapsing roof didn't upset him at all. In fact, he welcomed it. It was exactly what he wanted. As the roof plunged downward, the roaring and screeching sounds amplified into a nearly deafening cacophony. The top of the station wagon compressed against Billy's body and then his skull. The pain was excruciating and it was complete. Every part, of Billy screamed his humi Every part of Billy screamed his humanity as the car caved inward on top of Billy. Billy opened his mouth to scream. As Billy screamed, blood spurted from his mouth. For the first time, Billy welcomed the sight of his blood. 
It reminded him of who he really was. That reminder comforted him as his consciousness gave in and let go. Ah! Uh... <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That is such a good story. That is so good. Oh, I was on the verge of tears. I, I wasn't crying, actually. It wasn't as emotional as I thought it could have been. But just the sudden hit of, wait a second, I'm not an animatronic. That is pretty, like, chilling to me. Uh, at, like, after all this time, like, you go back and you remember the beginning of the story when Billy was just an innocent kid dancing around his room with, like, uh, what, like a comb in his hand singing about Freddy Fazbear or whatever. Like, I am an animatronic. Uh, <laughs> he was doing that, and right at the end, like, he realises... I have never been a robot. It's all been, like, it's all been fake. My imagine realizing your entire existence is like not what you believe it is. That like that is kind of a terrifying concept. And just the realization and the sudden sadness, melancholy that comes from being alone in that kind of world, that is so scary to me. And this story is really, really good. I really hope you agree with that. Uh, this story has so much theory potential, I am telling you, and that is why I'm going to be making a few videos on this, probably. Um, it definitely has connections to Gregory, I would say. Uh, I would say it has connections to Freddy and Friends on tour and Gregory and how they connect, because I think I have a very interesting theory on how this story kind of connects the dots for us on how Gregory might be a robot. Um, but yeah, this story, masterpiece. It's brilliant. It might be up there, like, I said Help Wanted was my favourite story. Um, I, it might genuinely be up there with Help Wanted. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to take a few days to process this uh, <laughs> this story as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and listening. And if you've been listening to all of my audiobooks, thank you so much. Uh, I have actually already uploaded the epilogue. So you can go and read that if you haven't read the epilogue already. It's a pretty good one. But um, yeah, thank you for watching and I will see you later. Goodbye.